Hey everyone, this is Ryan Jones from Serverless Guru. In this video, we're going to be watching a uh, video by, I, think I believe it's James, from AWS, who's a senior developer advocate for Serverless. And he's going to be talking about the S3 to Lambda serverless design pattern. I'm going to listen to it. I'm going to give my thoughts on the stuff that's being talked about. And we'll see what that looks like. And then we have additional videos that we can watch here. Serval or AWS just released uh, six videos on serverless. So we're going to go through one by one on that. And then we'll see how it, how it goes. All right. So I'm going to play it and we'll get going. I'm a senior developer advocate. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> there we go. My name is James Bezik. I'm a senior developer advocate here at AWS Serverless. Today I'm going to show you the S3 to Lambda serverless design pattern and how it can become a flexible core for your serverless applications. In this model, you configure S3 to notify Lambda when certain events happen. In this video, I'll show how this works in detail, review the characteristics of both services, and why knowing these is useful. I'll also discuss now, this is a really useful tool for building highly scalable applications. S3 to Lambda is a powerful combination when designing serverless solutions, and it can be important in a, as a starting point in thinking about your system's design. When an object is created, copied, or deleted in S3, S3 can invoke Lambda. You configure notification settings on a bucket and grant S3 permission to invoke a function based upon resource-based permission policies. It invokes asynchronously with an event containing details about the object and can match on an object key, prefix, or suffix. And if you need to fan out, you can also link this to SNS instead. What are the characteristics of these services? Yeah, so one thing being talked about here, which is really interesting, is that S3 allows you to store images, allows you to store different types of documents, things like that. Based on uh, S3 bucket is what they call it, you can actually trigger additional functionality that can then process that. So if you, let's say you upload an image, you can end up doing a resizing of that image. You can end up adding a different background to it. Uh, you can do a whole bunch of things like that. And what he just mentioned is that you can also attach an AWS S3 bucket to SNS. And what SNS can do is it can invoke, you know, five or seven different Lambda functions that can run in parallel. So imagine that for your imaging app, like let's say it's Instagram, you're going to generate seven different types of images based on that one image upload. You could hook that S3 bucket up uh, with, an upload, um, with an upload trigger that triggers a Lambda function, or sorry, triggers SNS then SNS is going to do a fan out pattern and it's going to invoke seven Lambda functions, which will pull that file in during the invocation when the Lambda function is running. It'll do the uh, background, the filtering, all the image manipulation to store that back into an S3 bucket. And then it can even then trigger something else. And that could be another Lambda function, which then sends an email to the user saying that their upload is finished and ready to download. So that's one example of that. Uh, it's a really awesome pattern. It's very easy to use. It's good for machine learning. It's good for, uh, any type of data processing. Uh, most workloads that interact with uh, S3 buckets and store anything like images, documents, uh, it's super useful and we use it all the time at Serverless Guru as well. A little interruption, went downstairs to grab my food. Uh, got some food delivered to the house um, or apartment. And so now we're gonna be jumping back into the video. So let's get started. Train permission model. Lambda is our functions as a service offering at the heart of the AWS serverless portfolio. It provides 100 millisecond billing, so you're charged for the length of time you use the service. You can configure memory, which also controls the amount of virtual CPU available to your code. It also supports a number of runtimes, including Node.js, Python, .NET, Go, and Java. And you can bring your own runtime too. We have people using PHP, Perl, and even COBOL. It's stateless and scales automatically, and it's event-driven. The reason... Okay, so here we go. So uh, the initial thing is S3, then we have the Lambda function that connects to it. S3 bucket we talked about can trigger a Lambda function. Lambda functions is actually where it's running that processing doing that additional image filtering, those type of things. Uh, and what really nice about Lambda is that it's uh, pay per use. So you're not being charged on an hourly rate, which is most virtual machines or containers. You're actually pay per use. So if you're, for instance, if your users don't upload any S3 or any images to S3, and you don't have any images to actually invoke those Lambda functions to then process, because you never got the image to begin with, you're not actually being billed for that. So you're not billed for the storage and you're not billed for the invocation if you're not getting any requests. If you get requests, you'll get billed by the, uh, I think it's like 100 millisecond uh, billing as rounded up as, as it showed there. Uh, and also something that he mentioned there is that no matter what language you're writing in, you can actually make that work with Lambda. And they even allow for custom runtimes now. So you can actually 
work additional things in there. So like even even COBOL, I saw someone that's doing COBOL with AWS Lambda. So that's people can do all sorts of stuff. PHP, as you mentioned, uh, GoLang, Python, Node.js, all that stuff. Um, what else was mentioned? Uh, functions of the service. That's typically referred to. That was the initial like. Uh, the serverless term for a while meant functions of the service. It's grown slowly since then. And now when we can think about serverless, we think about a much broader lens about what is serverless and what does that actually mean. Um, before, it was just functions of the service. It just represented you know, AWS Lambda or cloud functions, which were pay per use, would turn off and on. Um, now it represents fully managed services. It represents, some people even talk about the serverless state of mind, uh, which is a way of basically saying that thinking about giving off this, like uh, giving off, offloading as much as possible so you can focus on your product, focus on your customers, decrease your feedback loop between building things and getting that, that crucial information to make sure that your product actually meets or fits the, uh, the market need. And if you do those things, then you can actually build really uh, amazing applications and uh, it opens up a lot of possibilities, especially around innovation for bigger companies. And that's innovation for bigger companies. So like, what I mean by that is that for these bigger companies that have a lot of a lot of money and a lot of team members, if you have that much brain power and you're no longer worrying about all the infrastructure and the underlying issues, you can actually do a lot of really cool stuff. And I think that that's where sometimes people think about, oh, serverless is so trendy, it's all these things, but they, they don't look at the idea of like, oh, wow, if we implemented this and we saved all this time and we saved all of this this knowledge requirement and this this barrier of entry to make things work, like then what, what, we, what would we focus on? What would our day look like, right? And I think that that's a really cool space to be in because as your developers aren't focused on just the day-to-day-to-day, -to -day -to -day, like imagine you had a presentation they had to make every single day, right? That's all you did. There's no way that you could think about anything else but getting that presentation done by the end of the day, every single day, right? There's no, there's no way that you're thinking about creative processes or new things that you could build or innovative services or how you could automate different processes. You don't have enough time. You have to get that... That, that spreadsheet or that presentation done every single day. And so now, with the ability to go, okay, this thing is gonna be generated automatically. You know, I'm, maybe it's a, maybe now in a serverless world, instead of me building that, that's, that slideshow from scratch or that spreadsheet from scratch, there's actually a platform where I can just put in those little fields, you know? And so it takes my total time of like building, designing all these things to then being able to use something like Slidebean, uh, where it's, it allows you to actually uh, build these really awesome slide decks or pitch decks uh, for the startups out there, and you can do that. You can you can move move around things very easily, uh, similar to like Google Slides, and then you don't have to worry about the very minor details about how to actually construct it from scratch. And that allows you to move really fast because that means the less time from an idea to to actual putting it out there into reality means the more innovative uh, energy and the more uh, things that your company is going to be able to do. And so I'm really excited about that. I sound like I sound like an evangelist or something. I'm not really sure, but <laughs> regardless, let's, let's get back into the video. We're only two minutes in and the passion is coming out. So yeah. The reason for highlighting these services' main capabilities and features is that it's important when you combine these services, you can get the benefits of both services in a single application. If you've worked with Lambda in any way or run through any tutorials already, you've probably come across this example. This solution allows you to optimize images stored in S3 at the point where they're written to the bucket. It uses a Lambda function to process the image to optimize the size and quality. What happens here is that an S3 bucket exists to receive the images. The Lambda function is configured to resize or optimize an image using a library like ImageMagick. The S3 bucket triggers the Lambda function, and after the image operation, the final image is stored in a second S3 bucket. There are many implementations of this available online for different runtimes using different image libraries. It's an often quoted example, so I won't rehash it here extensively, but it shows some of the important ideas behind serverless. Don't worry, I already rehashed it. <laughs> it's the first thing I brought up, was the image manipulation example. So why not just resize images using EC2? You could easily install a script on EC2 to crawl images in buckets and process them in a similar fashion. Well, the image resizing example highlights some key benefits of taking this problem and approach. Yes, yeah, so I really like this, this, uh, this approach to explaining this because now James is starting to talk about what about if you did this with an EC2 instance, right? What would it look like? Um, and I think that that's a really important you know, kind of comparison that you have to make because if you have a server with you created it manually, it's running 24-7, uh, you know, it may be idle most of the time, and then, you know, sometimes it's just like a one-off thing that needs to happen. It's not going to be the constant usage on your application. It's only people getting their images manipulated. You know, this is a really good example, and, I, and I'm interested to hear, you know, what James has to say here. Approaching it serverlessly. First is scalability. We bring compute to the data. What do I mean by that? Well, it's less obvious when you observe the image resizer function operating on a single image, but if thousands of images arrive, you can see how Lambda responds and scales up. 
From the developer's perspective, you only write the code that would manipulate a single file and don't need to worry about how it works at scale. It shows how event-driven architectures work in a distributed system. Lambda is inactive until triggered by an event, in this case the arrival of a new object in an S3 bucket. This event invokes the Lambda function with a JSON payload describing what just happened. The Lambda function performs its work and then terminates. In terms of flow, the control is orchestrated by the event happening. Cost is another consideration. Not only are you paying per image resize, both in the storage in S3 and the invocation cost of Lambda, but this also makes cost more easily attributable. If you're building a SaaS product or an application for clients, it's extremely easy to calculate the cost by customer. For security, between the access control list on the objects in the bucket, the bucket policy, and the IAM policies of the function, if configured with the principles of least privilege, it can create a highly secure approach to the problem with minimal ongoing security maintenance. And finally, it's serverless, so that means there's no operating systems to patch, instances to scale, or infrastructure to manage. All right, so just look at that uh, recap. Scalable, so uh, as he says here, brings compute to data. Event-driven, invoked in response to S3 activity. Image gets uploaded, invoke the Lambda function to process it, to resize the image. Pay for the value, round it to the 100 millisecond. Lambda function is going to run. When it stops, you're not being billed any longer. Security, they use Identity Access Management, or IAM, on AWS, and that allows you to set up very granular permissions. You can also do things like pre-signed URLs, which allow you to have a private S3 bucket, but then give that pre-signed URL to, let's say, a front end. They can actually then put a, uh, an image into your back end, and, that, and they'll get a link to actually do that. And if they use that link, it'll last for maybe 60 seconds or 15 seconds, uh, and then it'll expire, and that private bucket will not be able to be accessed. And it can work only for, uh, let's say, put object, so you're putting something into a bucket, or get object, getting something out of a bucket, and only last for you know, 15, 30 seconds, whatever that needs to be. So those are all really cool ways that you can actually do very, very interesting and, and difficult security out of the box with S3. And so that's why it's been, as he said at the very beginning, a flagship product of AWS. And this last one, serverless, there's no infrastructure to manage. There's no, you're not storing this on, on your own server or something like that. There's no FTP client or, or something like that. You know, this is, this is being fully managed. It's like using Dropbox with APIs is how I like to think about it. Either Dropbox or Google Drive, the same thing. Um, you know, you can host a Google Drive file at a URL. That's pretty much what S3 is. Um, you know, Google has their own APIs to interact with that. Uh, it's the same thing. It's just much, much better worked into, you know, cloud services uh, environment. Because, for instance, uh, you know, think about Google. I believe they have something called Google Apps Script, which would allow you to actually potentially take actions off of a Google Drive upload. But it's going to be so, it feels very hacky. Um, whereas AWS is very streamlined, uh, it's the de facto way to actually build these type of event-driven architectures to do this stuff. So if you're thinking about what cloud provider do I use, I would definitely go with AWS in this scenario. I haven't looked too much at Azure's offerings or the most up-to-date Google ones. I know Google now does have their own uh, you know, Google bucket offering, Google Cloud bucket offering, and it can actually invoke their cloud function from Google side. And I'm sure Azure has the same thing, but you know, at the end of the day, it's not just about them mirroring the functionality, it's about them mirroring all the supporting layers, right? And so supporting layers, how do you make the S3 bucket? How do you make the Lambda function? How do you do deployments and code updates? How easy is the system to work with? How much integration is there with other services such as SNS or additional services? Um, how much maturity does the product offering have? So it's not just the fact that, oh, you can do image manipulation on Azure, Google Cloud, or AWS. It's how much of all those different factors I just mentioned does this provider actually hit? And if they don't hit it, then potentially that's not the right cloud provider to go with. Now, although the image resizer function is definitely interesting and useful, it's only the beginning of the things you can do when you attach a function to an S3 event. This is also a good point to introduce Sam, the serverless application model. Sam's also a squirrel who's the mascot for our service. As you start to develop serverless applications, you'll be creating infrastructure, Lambda yeah, so going back to what I just said a second ago with the, uh, the supporting factors into which provider you're going to actually choose, infrastructure as code, which we're about to get into right now and James is going to talk about, is a very important piece of that. For serverless guru, we mostly use serverless framework. Uh, serverless application model, it's an AWS CloudFormation extension, as he says here. And it's, you know, we've, we've wrote extensively at the serverless guru team, and we've also done some presentations at Stackery, where we actually talk about the differences between AWS SAM, CloudFormation, serverless framework, you know, all the Terraform, uh, for instance, all those, and even the CDK as well. And so all those different ways to actually build the S3 bucket, 
build a Lambda function, handle code deployments, they all do the exact same thing. It's just a matter of how seamlessly does it work and how easy is it for a developer to actually interact with and understand. And the thing about the serverless application model, uh, it's a bit of a heavy-handed extension of CloudFormation where the serverless framework is a little bit more streamlined. So it's going to be, the serverless framework is going to do a lot of stuff in the background for you automatically where AWS SAM is still going to take that like manual configuration. It'll save you a little bit of code, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty robust. And also it's not open source, it's underneath the umbrella of, uh, of AWS itself. So I, I do like the open source uh, version better just because it gives me all the different plugins and uh, you know, interaction with uh, just the community in general, right? So I get to, if there's something that's missing from CloudFormation or something that's missing from AWS SAM, I have to rely on the AWS team to implement it. Whereas with the serverless framework, somebody could just make a plugin tomorrow, or I can make a plugin. I've actually made plugins before. Um, and then I can use that inside of my application to solve my use case. And potentially I can make that open source as well, share it with other people, and then they can, that, that'll help them solve their use case. So it's a very sharing community. And uh, on top of that, behind the scenes with um, the serverless framework, for instance, if you build a plugin, you're actually using JavaScript at that point. So it becomes a lot easier to interact add additional functionality. There's even webhooks that are in there, so you can actually hook into the beginning of the deployment cycle and after the deployment cycle. What that looks like is, let's say, let's imagine that you were gonna actually seed that S3 bucket with data. So in that case, you would have a S3 plugin, maybe creates the, or sorry, not an S3 plugin, but you would have CloudFormation worked into uh, the serverless framework or serverless framework syntax to create the S3 bucket. And then once the S3 bucket's created, you'll have a plugin there that is actually hooked into uh, your serverless framework infrastructure as code, which will then do something like upload image files into that bucket automatically when you make a deployment. So maybe you know it's the first deployment. This is a very bad case, use case or very bad example, um, but I'm making it up off the top of my head, so please excuse me. Um, so imagine this. Imagine that you create this S3 bucket, you define inside of your serverless framework infrastructure as code, and then you have a plug in there that, that's then going to take that S3 bucket as an input and then it's going to inject uh, S3, or sorry, image files into that bucket automatically. And maybe it even does some additional things which aren't supported by CloudFormation natively. And, and in that case, you can end up doing really powerful things. So it, it allows you to get this kind of these two, like the superpower, right? You have CloudFormation, you have the serverless framework, abstracting some stuff, making it a little bit more simple. And then you have uh, plugins which allow you to integrate JavaScript into the CloudFormation. They come together you use webhooks to hook into the deployment cycle. And so then when you're actually deploying the S3 bucket, you can do something before, and then you can do something after. And that's a really uh, important thing, and it's, and it's pretty awesome, so yeah. The functions and triggers invoking Lambda functions. You can do all of this in the console, but it's much easier to automate through code. SAM is a CloudFormation extension designed to make the serverless application deployment that much easier. SAM simplifies the deployment and configuration so you can deploy the entire solution using simple commands from the CLI. Once you have a template, you simply type SAM deploy on your command line. Here is a simple SAM template that you'll see in one of the future videos. This tells AWS CloudFormation that it's a SAM template that it needs to transform. It specifies an input parameter, in this case a bucket name. In the resources section, it creates an S3 bucket, and also creates a Lambda function with the correct IAM policy, specifying the language runtime and memory required, and where the code can be found. It also specifies the event triggering the Lambda function, in this case. Yeah, so let's just pause there and let's look at this. So what we have here is we have a parameter section up top. So that's gonna be fed into the template that's gonna make dynamic values. Uh, you can see there we have a default there set as S3 auto translator. We have a resources section here with the S3 bucket itself. Uh, we're saying bucket name is a reference of this input bucket name. Uh, we have a translator function, so it's using the AWS serverless function syntax from AWS SAM. It's got memory size of 128, it's got Node.js 10 runtime. It's funny, or it's not funny, but it's, uh, it's interesting that they chose Node.js 10. This must be an old snippet, um, because this video was released six hours ago and the most up-to-date one's Node.js 12. But I'm sure it's just an old, an old, uh, an old demo. Um, and then uh, handler, app.handler, code URI, translator function. So you can just see a, a few things here, which um, you know, which are you know, kind of strike me. Like when I look at this, uh, I see things like uh, this input parameter section. When you're working with a serverless framework, you can take this entire thing and probably break it down. Uh, if this is like 50 lines for the serverless framework, it might be 20 lines. And that's because there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in the background. Uh, and that's a really nice thing, especially like right here, when we see file upload type S3, and we see bucket events, and we see S3 object created, what that means is that when a, 
an object goes into our S3 bucket like that image, it's then going to invoke our Lambda function, which we defined here, translator function. In the serverless framework, that's one line. So this whole entire thing down here is, is pretty much defined in like one line, but then we go into the rules section, it's gonna add an additional three lines. So it takes potentially that's like 10 or 12 lines down to like three or four lines. And that's really important because when you have 15 or 30 Lambda functions and they're all attached to different events, and you have to define all of them out in this long form syntax like this, it gets, it gets pretty intense. And so that would be one area that I would you know, look at this and go, okay, we got AWS SAM here, 50 lines, serverless framework, maybe 20 lines, but regardless, you're achieving the exact same result. It's just, it's just a matter of how many chances do you want to make a mistake, right? So, so my opinion on this is that the best code is the code you don't write, right? So that's a very important concept, the best code is the code that you don't write. The fastest deployment time is no deployment, right? So like the, the more ways that you can basically remove this, this is what the serverless uh, mindset is. You know, uh, it's basically offloading, we're offloading the responsibility of building these things from scratch. But if we have a chance to offload some of the extra additional uh, indentation, colons, the capitalization of these different things in here, like. For instance, if I got policies wrong and I tabbed it in one more, uh, it wouldn't work. It would throw in errors. If I spelled policies wrong, it wouldn't work. It would throw errors. Um, if I if I got one of these things, like if target language was supposed to have, or sorry, that's an environment variable. Let's say if memory size was supposed to have a capital S and I put a lowercase s, it would throw an error. And so all those little details can all be wrong slightly, especially like this. Like imagine that we said uh, input bucket name parameter and we spelled that wrong, or we had some weird default there, what about stage, what about multi-stage uh, deployments, right? So all those things come into play, and if we don't account for that, uh, and we don't know about it, and we don't have that expertise working with it, it increases our overhead uh, quite dramatically. And that's, as a result, that's why you know, there, there are consultants that do this full time, like myself, um, because the complexity level that comes along with serverless when you actually start working with it, um, you know, it starts off as doing it, an image, uh, image filtering or image manipulation use case, and it quickly grows out to be 30, 100 Lambda functions with all of these different event triggers, whether it's SQS for a queuing system, SNS for doing a fan out pattern, there's like, uh, there's uh, S3 being worked in to handle your image and document storage, there's application hosting, there's APIs, there's all this stuff that has to, you have to have that understanding and that expertise with, and if you don't, you run into these really uh, these really bad problems where you can end up, you know, this file to build it the first time, this could take you quite a while unless you found the exact template. Most of the time you're gonna need something slightly different than what this is. So like, let's say down here, uh, if we have filter S3 key rules and then name suffix value.txt, right? Well, what you don't know, there's different types of rules, right? There's different ways that you can specify that value. So if you specify that value wrong, it may not work. And if it doesn't work, it may be hard to track down, right? And so there's like, uh, because you go, okay, I uploaded the image, I did everything I was supposed to, it shows that it's connected to Lambda, well, what's going on, right? Why, why, is it not, why is it not connecting? And why is it not invoking my Lambda function properly? And there's little tiny things like that where if you get it, if you get it wrong, it won't work. And that's why, um, in my opinion, that would be why I would choose a serverless framework, and that's why I would try to find ways to take some of the responsibility of making sure every single little detail is correct and allow somebody that already built that automation, like the serverless team, to then handle that for me automatically. And then that, that allows me to skip past this, and then I get to focus on actually building a Lambda function, because that's all that matters, right? So we don't wanna just like move the ball from creating our server from scratch, having to install these packages, get it you know, get this really nice looking, you know, AMI, baking this AMI, so we can rebuild this server over and over again. We don't want to manually set up all this auto scaling. Uh, we want to focus on our actual application code. And it's the same thing with serverless. We don't want to focus on all the infrastructure and making sure all these little dials are tuned properly. We want to focus on our, our application code. And so right now the ball is kind of being shifted a little bit where it's still, it's like serverless is a bit more mature, but it also has a lot more room to grow and it's a lot more room to get more additional knowledge, a lot more tooling, things like that, to make the whole developer experience a lot better because um, you know, we're, we're in a place now where there is a lot of automation. Like if you look at Amplify, for instance, and you look at the stuff that they're doing, you know, there's a ton of automations happening in the background. Like you can build 
GraphQL APIs, front-end hosting, all these connections, GraphQL schemas, real-time subscriptions, all this stuff automatically. And, you know, that's a, it's a really killer, uh, a really killer thing that didn't exist, you know, uh, you know, five, six years ago, right? So we're in a really cool space right now. And there's a lot of cool tools and platforms and all this stuff coming out around serverless to help us and help the developers move away from defining the infrastructure as code to then moving to defining their actual application code itself. And uh, the serverless framework is the kind of the first iteration of that that's been very widely supported. In the future, there'll be other iterations from probably the serverless Inc. team as well as other teams out there. So yeah, that's my thoughts on it. I probably ranted for a little bit on it. Hopefully that's useful to see a different perspective on it and uh, let's keep going. As it says when new objects arrive in the bucket, it's looking for objects ending with .txt. Now when you run SAM deploy on this template, it actually creates the infrastructure. It would create the S3 bucket, the Lambda function, a DynamoDB table, and a second Lambda function. The S3 to Lambda pattern is very powerful, but actually very simple. The services handle scaling automatically, so your custom business logic only needs to focus on the tasks that matter to your application users. Using the serverless application model, our friend SAM, it's trivial to set up in your serverless application using just a few lines of YAML. Since S3 buckets can contain a virtually limitless amount of data, Lambda functions scale automatically when triggered by S3 events. This makes it easy to build enterprise-grade solutions with minimal code. In the next few videos, I'll walk through specific examples showing how you can use this pattern. Real quick, if you look close, you can see serverless days, and look at that, we got the serverless days t-shirt on, same as, uh, same as the sticker there, so represent. <laughs> to provide useful functionality in your business applications. I'll show you how you can do things like automated language translation, workflow management, and bringing sentiment analysis to audio recordings. Thanks for joining me for this brief introduction. To learn more about Lambda, visit aws.amazon.com forward slash Lambda. I hope to see you next time. Happy coding. Sweet. All right. So that was the video. Just went through S3 to Lambda. Uh, we just saw some information about how that pattern actually works. We talked through it. This was Ryan Jones, serverless guru. I'll see you next time in the next video. Uh, thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments if you want to hear my opinion on anything around serverless, cloud, the economy, anything. Uh, let me know, and I'll uh, I'll make a video about it. Cool. See ya.